Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains! Tampering in the domain of the forbidden. And today, we are going to be discussing mad science experiments again, yes. Creations that were basically just that. Except this time, we're gonna talk about ships. Not exclusively warships in this case. Some of these were actually meant for commercial or scientific purposes. Mad scientific purposes. These are five ships that are clearly just mad science experiments. The Glomar Explorer. Sometimes called the GSF Explorer, or originally it was known as the USNS Hughes Glomar Explorer. It was a deep sea drill ship platform. It was constructed in 1971 and 1972 by the Sun Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company at the specific direction of one Howard Hughes. Yep, that Howard Hughes, the one I just did a video about. I'll put a card of that video up in the corner in case you guys missed it. The ship was an insane project with incredible lifting potential. At the time, it cost $350 million. In today's money, that's one and a half billion. When the media asked Hughes, uh, why he was building such an insano ship, he explained that it was meant to extract manganese nodules from the ocean floor. That was a lie, that's not actually what it was for at all, but it became surprisingly influential, causing many others to examine the idea of doing that. In reality, this ship was actually developed specifically at the request of the CIA. See, on the 8th of March 1968, K-129, a Soviet diesel electric submarine sank in the Pacific Ocean, 1,560 miles northwest of Hawaii. She was discovered by the USS Halibut, and the CIA was interested in recovering the submarine for intelligence gathering purposes. It was in the middle of the Cold War, after all. But the K-129 had sunk in extremely deep water, at a depth of about 16,500 feet, three miles down or five kilometers. This wasn't the sort of situation where you could just lift it up casually. You needed something huge with a tremendous amount of power in order to pull this thing that distance from the ocean floor. And they needed a cover story since such a large ship would be easily detected by the Soviets, who, if they knew what they were doing, would absolutely try to stop them. The endeavor was codenamed Project Azorian, Though that name didn't become public until 2010. Originally, the press reported on it as Project Jennifer. In 1974, the Explorer recovered a portion of the K-129, but as the section was being lifted to the surface, a mechanical failure in the grapple caused about two-thirds of it to break off. That lost section is believed to have held many of the most sought items, like the codebook and the nuclear missiles. But the recovered section did hold two nuclear-tipped torpedoes and some cryptographic machines, as well as the bodies of six Soviet submariners. They were given a formal filmed burial at sea. Still, pulling anything up from that depth was a tremendous achievement, and the lifting capacity of the Explorer was not to be questioned, but unfortunately, she was a bit of a flawed design. Not in terms of what she could do, but in terms of how useful that was going to be. There just wasn't that much use for a ship with her unique attributes. They did attempt to lease her though, and her last owners weren't the Navy. Initially between 1996 and 1998, she was leased to Global Mining Drilling. However, they would merge with Santa Fe International Corporation to become Global Santa Fe Corporation, and later they merged with Transocean in November of 2007 to become just Transocean. Transocean wind up just straight up buying the Explorer in 2010 for $15 million. That's $18 million nowadays. And actually got substantial use out of her. Crew members fondly referred to her as the mothership due to her great size. But sadly, in April of 2015, Transocean announced the ship would be scrapped. And she was broken up in June of that year. The Baron of Ren... Renf... Renfrew? Is that what... Give me a second. Yeah, 
Renfrew. Okay. I, honestly, I expected it to be pronounced really weirdly, but it really is spoken phonetically, so that's good. This was a four-masted bark wooden sailing ship built in 1825 by Charles Wood in Quebec, Canada. She was actually one of the largest wooden ships ever built, and looking at her, you might not think she's a mad science experiment at all. Like, what's so weird about that? She's just a wooden sailing ship. You don't understand, okay? You don't understand how weird this concept is. This is a disposable ship. What? Let me try to explain this. She actually followed the construction of a similar disposable ship called the Columbus, but the Renfrew is way more interesting to me as she was a complete failure. The whole point of these types of ships was that they were supposed to transport timber from North America to Europe and be disassembled after taking the timber cargo off as the ship itself was also made of timber so they could use the wood from the ship too. Why would they do this? Well, it was because at the time there were very high taxes on imported timber. It was stagnating the industry. So as a way to get around that, it would basically make it so the ship would be taken apart too, and sold as timber. The ship itself couldn't be taxed under the laws of the time, because, well, it was the ship. So, with that context, it actually kind of makes sense why they were doing this. She sailed one time, though, on August 23rd, 1825, under the command of Captain Matthew Walker. She left Quebec with a crew of 25 men and a cargo of 9,000 tons of timber. Whether or not that number includes the weight of the ship herself is still debated on. But the point is there was a lot of timber there. She was bound for London, England. We know she definitely started breaking apart on the voyage. She wasn't made to last, and apparently couldn't last the trip across the Atlantic at all, which is the one trip she was supposed to last for. On the 21st of October that same year, her crew left her off the coast of Gravelines, and apparently she wound up breaking in three parts that were eventually found near Calais, all off the coast of France. So she almost made it, but still didn't. And disposable ships stopped being a thing pretty soon after. There was a later change in timber tax laws that wound up including these disposable ships in the kind of timber that would be taxed. So there really was no point in building them anymore. And even if there was, they should probably build them a little bit better. Like, not to break apart before they get to where they're going. That's all I'm trying to say. The HMS Zubian. Now, much like the last one, this one at the surface doesn't look that crazy or mad science-y, but this one actually might be the most literal interpretation of a ship created by Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> it was commissioned on the 7th of June, 1917, as the unexpected, misfit, outcast, 13th member of the Royal Navy's Tribal Class, or F-Class, of destroyers. Why is she so weird? What makes her special? Well, that's because she, first of all, was never supposed to be a thing. Zubian was not actually built from the ground up. See, Zubian is a portman too, of two other names of Tribal Class destroyers, HMS Zulu and HMS Nubian. Zubian is literally a combination of two of her sisters. What happened was, in late 1916, the Nubian and the Zulu were very badly damaged by German attacks in the English Channel. Nubian had her bow destroyed by a torpedo from a German torpedo boat on the 27th of October in the Battle of Dover Strait. Zulu had her stern blown off by a mine in the Channel on the 8th of November. Interestingly, both wound up staying afloat, despite being effectively blown in half, and were eventually towed to the Chatham Dockyard. Under normal circumstances, these two would have just been scrapped. There was really no reason to rebuild them, because, well, they'd lost half of them. The amount of money it would take to fix them would be better spent on a brand new ship, but it was the middle of World War I, and the Admiralty looked at them and realized, well, they've each lost the opposite half. Let's just stick them together. And that's exactly what they did. The four parts of Zulu were welded to the stern of Nubian. The end result only had about three and a half inches, 89 millimeters difference in beam. Zubian came into being. The first thing she ever did was confuse the heck out of the German Imperial Admiralty because they didn't know that a Zubian was being constructed. And technically, she never was. 
It was just kind of slapped together. But she served faithfully during the last years of World War I. She joined the 6th Flotilla, and during that period, she rotated through nighttime patrols of the Dover Strait. While doing that on the 4th of February in 1918, she actually sank a U-boat, UC-50. She also participated in the first Ofsted raid on the night of the 23rd, 24th of April. Despite being quite literally a Frankenstein's monster of a ship, the Zubian did well, extremely well, but not well enough to last past the war. She was completely worn out by the time the conflict was over, and to be fair, she was built out of used components from the get-go. She was sold for scrapping and broken up by December of 1919. Which is a shame, because if you preserved her as a museum ship, you could argue that she's kind of preserving three ships. Herself, plus the Zulu, plus the Nubian. I mean, technically, sort of, no, whatever. I like her. We like the Zubian here, okay? The RP Flip, which stands for Floating Instrument Platform, is an open ocean research platform owned by the U.S. Office of Naval Research, or ONR. Now, looking at this picture, you're probably like, that's not a ship, though. That's clearly a stationary platform. Here, take a look at this. You see it now? This is nuts. Absolutely absurd. I love it. Peak mad science going on here. The platform... <clears throat> is 108 meters, 355 feet long, and it's designed to partially flood and pitch backward 90 degrees, which results in only the front, 17 meters, 55 feet of the platform, pointing up out of the water. It's like half a submarine, sort of. It's so bizarre. The bulkheads become the decks in this format, and when she's flipped, most of the ballast for the platform is provided by water at depths below the influence of surface waves. This keeps her very stable and mostly immune to wave action, very similar to a spar buoy. When she's done, compressed air is pumped into the ballast tanks in the flooded section, and the platform, which itself actually has no propulsion, returns to its horizontal position so it can be towed to a new location. She's so bizarre that she's actually frequently mistaken for a capsized ocean transport ship. And, as I just said, technically you can't call her a ship because she can't move under any power of her own. She's effectively a barge. A really weird barge. But I couldn't resist talking about this because, yo, what the heck? But the ONR has gotten significant use out of this setup, with her ability to actually, you know, be moved around, it means they can use her for research in all sorts of different locations, stable research, to keep the workers safe. She's still in operation to this day, and has a complement of 5 crew and 11 researchers. She's meant to study wave height, acoustic signals, water temperature and density, and for the collection of meteorological data. Because of her working with acoustics, that's why she has no means of propulsion. She could be given an engine, technically. Because they want to minimize residual sounds, no engine was installed. Even some of her indoor furniture is specially designed to do what she does. The toilet seats, for example, can flip 90 degrees, as can the shower heads. And there are overhead lights installed on the surfaces that become the ceilings in both towing and flipped orientations. She's such a unique piece of equipment, but again, very interesting and very good at what she's for. So more power to her, I say. The Ramform Titan. This ship is a marine seismic acquisition vessel built by the MHI shipyard in Nagasaki, Japan in 2013. So this is a fairly new ship. It's sometimes called the widest ship in the world at the waterline, as her width at the stern is 70 meters, 230 feet. And at the moment, she's operated by a Norwegian company, Petroleum Geoservices, or PGS, who use her for 3D seismic data acquisition. PGS has actually wound up building four of the Titan classes. The second ship is Ramform Atlas, the third is Ramform Hyperion, and the fourth is Ramform Tethys. These are all fantastic names, by the way. And I don't just call them mad science experiments because of their peculiar design. That's not the only reason. For one thing, the reason they were built in such a weird way 
was to make them as stable as possible in any weather to keep the crew safe even if they had to work in the middle of a storm. These vessels are also capable of running survey streams behind them, 24 of them in total, that could span well over 100 kilometers. In fact, they broke a world record for this in 2015 when they ran 129.6 kilometers of streamers during one of their surveys. And yet, that's still not the most insane thing about them. All the stuff the ship does requires a lot of power to do it. That makes sense. Her engine is a little bit nonsense though. She can produce 26.4 megawatts of unspeakable power. Just so we're clear, two megawatts of power is about enough to power 400 average homes. So the Titan class's power supply can comfortably give energy to over 5,000 homes. A very impressive beast. Some actually call them ugly, but I think they're kind of neat, not gonna lie. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hawk 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Trouble Defoon, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Major Klutz, Hayden DeGro, Ohio Trucker One, and Master of None. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.